Hello and welcome to this Australian Biocommons webinar. My name is Melissa Burke and I'm the Australian Biocommons Training and Communications Officer and I'll also be your host for today. This webinar is part of a series in which we share useful information about the latest digital techniques, data and tools that are available for the life sciences community. Each month we hear from our local and international peers on a bioinformatics topic that we hope will help you achieve your best agricultural, medical or environmental research. You can keep up to date with the latest news and events by following us on social media or through our website. To begin the webinar, we will take a moment to pause and acknowledge the traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands on which we meet today. Today, we are joining you from the lands of the Turrbal and Yagara people in Brisbane and the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation in Melbourne. We pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country, and we recognise their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. Today, we're thrilled to welcome Dr. Alan Rubin to the webinar to speak to us about MAVEDB and how it aids the discovery and interpretation of high throughput functional assay data. Alan has a PhD in genome sciences from the University of Washington, and he is a senior research officer in the WEHI Bioinformatics Division and co head of the WEHI Multiplex Assay Technology Hub. Alan also serves on the executive committee of the Atlas of Variant Effects Alliance, an international collaborative effort to produce multiplex functional data to inform human disease. He is also the data curation and dissemination workstream lead for this initiative. Welcome to the webinar, Alan. I'm now going to hand it over to you to start your presentation. Great. Um, thank you so much. It's really great to be here with you today uh, to tell you about um, MAVEDB and the discovery and interpretation of high throughput functional assay data. So we're going to talk about uh, high throughput functional assay data. So there's two main types of high throughput functional assays uh, that we're concerned with. So in, together, these are all sort of under an umbrella that we call multiplex assays of variant effect. And um, there's a, two main types. One is DMS or deep mutational scanning. Uh, these are um, assays of coding regions, generally speaking. And uh, the other one, the other type that's commonly used is our MPRAs or massively parallel re reporter assays. And these are more concerned with um, non-coding elements, particularly promoters and enhancers or other elements that can drive expression. Now, most of the things that I'm going to talk about today in terms of how we look at the data, uh, how we um, store the data, how we look at um, and uh, how we use it can be applied to either of these, but most of my expertise uh, is over here on the deep mutational scanning side, looking at coding variants. So we're going to focus primarily on coding variation, although I'm happy to take any questions that you might have um, about the, the MPRA side of things. Um, and speaking of coding variation, I think that it's it's useful um, to kind of reflect on sort of the history of genomics and note that um, advances in technology always really start with the genes. And this makes sense because we understand the coding genome the best. So if we think about how well we understand a different type of variation, then coding variation is over here at the end where we understand it the best. We've understood how the grammar works since 1961. We know a lot about you know, the context and the organization um, of coding elements. Uh, for non-coding regions, we're still learning the rules that govern transcriptional regulation and other processes, but we're making a lot of progress. Uh, for structural variation, uh, it may not even make sense to think about rules or a grammar that underlies structural variation. I think it's fair to say that we understand it kind of mechanistically the least well. Um, and the consequence here is that our, our greater knowledge of coding variation means that we're more able to apply insights from coding sequences in a clinical translation context. Um, you know, at the other end, we're still sort of cataloging variation and trying to understand it. And so today's talk is in, in some sense about what we can do with coding variants once we have a lot of them, uh, and what we can do with this greater understanding to drive clinical translation. And I hope that the lessons that we learn in trying to do this and apply this information in this context of deep mutational scanning will be useful to researchers working on other types of, of variants and other types of genomic information as they continue to progress um, along this gradient. So I've just told you how well we understand coding variation and how we, we really have a good handle on it. And so how are we doing here? Well, the answer is not as well as we would like to be doing. So this donut plot here shows you the, um, the 
classification of missense variants, these are only variants that alter an amino acid in ClinVar, which is, I think, the largest uh, or sort of the most, certainly the most widely used database of um, clinical genetic variation, um, and it's showing them colored by their classification. So this gray portion here that's almost three quarters of it is VUS, or variants of uncertain significance. And this is a big issue because if it's a variant of uncertain significant, we don't significance, we don't know if it's pathogenic, which is that it contributes to disease, or benign, which is that it does not. And so these variants cannot be used for um, guiding patient treatment or patient diagnosis. And we used to think that maybe if we sequence enough people, we would figure it out, but that's clearly not the case because we look at the growth of the number of missense variants in ClinVar over time. Uh, we are seeing this exponential growth of variants of uncertain significance, and everything else is kind of ticking on the bottom. We do see this big uptick in, in benign variants, um, which I think coincides with the release of, of Nomad and some of these other population resources that allow us to you know, make the assumption that um, things that are at a high frequency in the population are more likely to be benign. But uh, it's obvious that we need to bring other types of data to bear if we're going to be able to classify these types of patient variants accurately so that they can be used um, for their benefit. And what I'm going to tell you about today is that I think that high throughput functional data can help us solve this problem of variance of uncertain significance. This is one type of data that we can use, um, and but we need to make sure that the data is getting into the hands of the clinicians who need it. So if we start here on the left with um, with the researcher, uh, we need to we can then deposit the data into a database, uh, which can then flow into perhaps another local database, which will then make its hands into this make its way into the hands of a variant curation scientist who can return results to a clinician, who can pass that information back to the patients, and then patient need can drive future efforts in data generation. And so today I'm going to tell you about how we're trying to help close this kind of bench to bedside loop here and the three key challenges um, that, we're, that we're working on uh, to bring this high throughput functional data into the clinic. And so these are data generation, uh, data sharing and standardization, and then building translational data models. And so we're gonna start with some background on how we generate the data. Uh, I think it's useful to, for people to understand kind of where the data is coming from, what types of experiments um, people are doing. Uh, and, and I'll give you kind of a quick overview of what kinds of, kind of data is available. Um, and so if we think about how we get started, so we need to, if we want to assay a bunch of genetic variants, we need to start with a bunch of DNA molecules that encode a library of genetic variants. So we're gonna we're gonna run the make these variants and run them through a functional assay system. So we're gonna generate a library of DNA molecules, including encoding for a deep mutational scan, all possible single nucleotide changes or all possible single amino acid changes in a gene of interest, and then transform them into cells. And there's a lot of different ways to do it, but one of the things that they have in common is that we always start with a target sequence. So here's a target sequence. We've got it's I've split it into codons because it's a coding sequence. Uh, so it gets translated into amino acids. And then we can have a variant here. So the variant, we've changed the nucleotide, that changes the amino acid. But of course, since this is a deep mutational scan and we're doing a saturation mutagenesis, we actually have many variants. So we're going to have every possible single nucleotide variant, possibly every um, whole codon substitution shown here in red. And then we can also um include, for example, uh, whole codon deletions, whole codon insertions. So we get a very complex library of tens of thousands of unique DNA molecules encoding all of these different DNA variants, and each cell gets one. And so we can do that at the level of, you know, a sort of a cDNA cell model where we take um, a cell line, like often a sort of a workhorse cell line, like a HEC293T cell. Um, and put a landing pad into a landing pad contract into it that allow us to transform one of these variant cDNAs in there and then drive expression of it in the assay system. So this is one very well established method of getting these, these DNA molecules into cells so that we can assay them. There are also CRISPR based approaches where we actually uh, use HDR to and a, and a repair template to um, introduce the variants into the locus into the endogenous locus in the cell. So this is maybe a little bit more uh, kind of real because you're getting this, this sort of 
the local chromatin context and you can pick up splicing variants and things like that. However, it's much more technically challenging and, and more expensive. Um, so it's good for, for sort of different applications. And then a newer area that I think is attracting a lot of interest now, which is not perhaps not technically a multiflux assay or a deep mutational scan, um, are these new applications of, of CRISPR-based technologies. So that is the CRISPR-based base editors um, and prime editors. So the base editors uh, have you know, these enzymes that, um, that uh, can change Cs to Ts and As to Gs. Um, and you can target them wherever you want and make your mutations. And then prime editing is, is a sort of expansion of the uh, sort of more traditional CRISPR approach where you can provide the repair template and the RNA. And I think that these allow people to make a lot of mutations in regions that are interesting for them um, at a smaller scale, you know, and often with fewer uh, technical and, and resource barriers um, to do them. And I think that as we're moving forward through the through this presentation and talking about, you know, what can we do with multiplex assay data and demutational scanning data, uh, we can do all of the same things with base editing and prime editing. We can use the same standards. We can use the same data models. We can use all of that same kind of stuff. Um, so now that we've talked about how to get the uh, get these variants into cells, um, I'll say that you know we want to then perform an assay. So we've now got a population of cells where each cell has exactly one DNA variant in it. That, so it's expressing a variant protein. And then we can, for example, grow them in a context where the proper function of that protein is required for the cells to be viable. And so cells will grow at different rates depending on what the impact of that mutation is. So if that or if that variant is. So if that variant is loss of function, then the cells will grow less, less well or maybe die. If it's a wild type like variant, so the variant has very little effect, then the cells will grow normally. And then we use um, high throughput sequencing to sequence a sample of the population uh, at the beginning after we've created the library, and then again after the after growth. And then we can essentially look at this in, as an enrichment depletion experiment and measure the effect by comparing these counts and measure the effect of all of the different variants in our assay and produce a heat map like this, which we call a variant effect map, which shows the functional score um, of each. So the functional score is shown by the color of the cell. Each cell is a variant. So we have the columns are positions in the protein. Rows are the amino acids that are being um, mutated to. And uh, in this case, red is gain of function and blue is loss of function. And so we get these sort of very interesting um, heat maps that we can look at. And you can see often a lot of structure and patterns. So certain regions that are not tolerant to mutations, other regions that are, you can see if you cluster the amino acids by their physiochemical properties, you can see what types of changes are tolerated at a position and which ones aren't. And so it can give a really kind of a rich picture of um, what the constraints are and therefore what the function, what may be di dictating the function of the protein, uh, which can be really value valuable, especially for experts uh, in a certain gene. And of course, we can use each of these individual measurements um, to assist in this clinical translation problem that I told you about before, where we can say, well, the assay says that this variant is loss of function, so that may be evidence towards pathogenicity. Now, we can do this with cell growth, but we can actually use a lot of different assays. Um, so we can look at growth, we can look at um, you know, molecular properties like you know, surface expression, we can look at visual phenotypes that you can see on a confocal microscope and then sort cells. Um, based on their, based on what they look like. Uh, we can use a variety of different fluorescent reporters, kind of any, any sort of fax functional assay can be adapted to this. And then there's a, there's also single cell experiments where we can actually, for each individual variant, we can get a set of single cell transcriptomes and then try to understand uh, what that's telling us about what the variant is doing. Um, as you can imagine, there's a lot of heterogeneity here, especially when we consider that these are being done in a lot of different assays as well. So we've got, you know, yeast assays for yeast proteins. We've also got yeast assays for human proteins. We've obviously got mammalian cells, bacterial cells, uh, viruses. So viruses for viral proteins like influenza, HIV, uh, SARS-CoV-2. Also, uh, just using the viral system like as like a bacterial phage system in order to do a biochemical assay. So it's really, there's as many different types of functional assays as people have done, like you can do that 
diverse that same diversity of you know deep mutational scanning and multiplex assay experiments. So one of the big challenges that we have as we're trying to sort of organize all of the data and put it together um, is in data standardization and sharing. And so that's um, what I'm going to tell you here about MaveDB, which was in the title of the talk, which is the database for multiplex functional data. We launched it um, almost five years ago now, um, and it contains over 800 data sets and more than 8 million variant effect measurements. Um, and this is a, uh, it's a community database where anyone can deposit their data. It's free for everybody to access. Most of the uh, data is licensed uh, CC0 public domain. We really want to make it open and possible for everybody to um, you know, not only share their data sets, but, but also access it for any sort of research or clinical applications that they want. And um, you know, many millions of variants have been measured by, by MAVE. So here's a figure showing the cumulative number of variants that we pulled from the literature um, a couple of years ago now. And, um, and we think that this is a really powerful set of data that we want to get out into the world. Uh, the data that we have in MAVEDB is diverse, but it's mostly human. So a little bit less than half of the of the uh, of the target genes that were the basis for the for the mutagenesis are human. Um, and then we do have a lot of really relevant clinical genes. So these genes that are on the um, ACMG, the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics secondary findings list, that is genes where if a, a genetic test has been ordered for a condition and then a variant shows up in one of these genes where that's not the indicated condition, it should still be reported. Like many secondary results are not reported um, clinically, but these are all the genes where we feel like we have a better handle on knowing kind of what the gene is, what the gene does and that is clinically important. And so we have a bunch of data sets for these ACMG genes. Um, a bunch of them we have multiple data sets for, which presents its own interesting challenge in terms of the interpretation and management of the data and uh, you know how we how we work with it clinically. If you have multiple functional assays, which may or may not agree with each other, and which may all be right because they may be measuring different things, um, this is sort of an ongoing challenge in terms of how we uh, structure and work with the data. Um, if you are if you are interested in, in a specific gene or a specific pathway, um, you can also, or if you're interested in, in performing one of these experiments, um, you can check out the MAVE registry, which is a um, an open platform to track data generation efforts. So uh, researchers can go to the MAVE, MAVE registry. You can say that you know I'm interested in doing a deep mutational scan on this gene. And you're, you can say, well, we've started making in the library, or we're still at the literature search, literature search and design phase. Um, and you can find other like-minded people who are maybe interested in collaborating. And this has actually been the source of a lot of, um, of really excellent uh, international collaborations, because there's, there's enough genes that we can avoid any sort of unproductive competition. So you can look and see if something that you're interested in is being worked on and look at the progress of projects. Um, you can also register your interest in having a gene scanned, and this is something where we're trying to also reach out to um, members of the uh, of various uh, disease-focused uh, research and, and patient advocacy communities to see, you know, kind of where the field can make the most impact. So I think this is a really nice resource if you're curious about, about what's going on and what may be coming soon. Um, so back to MAVDB, you know, thinking about how we needed to organize the data and what the data data looks like. We we built this hierarchical model to split this into sort of three levels. So we have um, at the highest level, we have an experiment set, which contains all of the assays that were performed in the study. Usually it's one assay per study. Sometimes it's more than one. Um, we have an experiment record that describes the assay and its replicates. It, re it describes um, how the variant library was generated, how the assay was performed, how the high throughput sequencing was performed. And then from the high throughput sequencing step on, um, that information about the data analysis and how the variants were counted and processed um, is stored in the score set record. And the reason why we separated these was because we wanted to be able to track different analysis of the same raw data in a way that faithfully tracks the fact that an assay was performed by one set of investigators and then maybe analyzed by somebody else. And then it's also easy, easier to discover um, different related experiments. 
So here's an example of a, of a relatively complex uh, experimental design that was one of the things that we had in mind when we were designing this model. So here we have one gene. It was analyzed using a phage display experiment and also a yeast based assay. And then those two were sequenced. And then each of those da raw data sets were analyzed two different ways to produce two different sets of scores, one of which are scores at the amino acid level and the other one are scores at the nucleotide level. And so now if somebody gets handed a variant from one of these, from one of these data sets, it's fairly straightforward to, with that variant measurement in mind, to come back to MAVDB and track back through this hierarchy and find all of the related data that may be of interest. So all the other data that's associated with the same study, um, other representations of those variants, and so forth. Uh, we also put a lot of uh, thought into supporting reanalysis of scores. So because we want to store kind of the the more raw score, so the ones that that come pretty much straight out of the the initial scoring scoring approach. Um, but then we wanted to allow people to, for example, jointly reanalyze two data sets. So here's an example of two data sets for the gene P10, um, which were performed at two different times. So they did the first the they did the first experiment, and then the investigators did a second experiment where they went back and tried to fill in all the variants that they missed the first time, and then they analyzed them together. So when we put this in MeDB, now we can say, okay, so this experiment was performed first, and then this other experiment was performed second, and here's the data from that experiment, and then here's the combined data, which may be what you actually want to look at. And this is really important as we're thinking about how to move into this clinical translation space where one of the things that we're very concerned about is um, data provenance and, and tracking. Because um, we want to make sure that if someone is wanting to incorporate one of these functional assay results into a clinical report or use it for variant classification, we want to make sure that they are able to track back all the way to where the data was generated. And if that was because the statistical model was applied to multiple data sets or there was some sort of a complicated imputation step or something like that, we want them to be able to get all the way back to the raw reads without it being kind of a guessing game or not really knowing where the data came from. Um, so to date, you know, we've, we haven't really hit anything that we haven't been able to capture using this data model, but um, it's always an ongoing uh, process, you know, in terms of maintaining one of these kind of databases is continuing to, you know, look at what's coming out in the literature, what people are doing and, and, and continuing to update it. And I'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to data standards. Um, so I know that this is a audience that, that has, there's a lot of people, probably a lot of people in the audience have an interest in bioinformatics and you would want to see some data. So here's an example of what the data looks like um, in a table that, that comes from the, from the MeDB database. So we have um, these first two, two columns are required. So this is an, an HGVS-like string that describes the variant with respect to the target sequence. Uh, uh, people who deposit data are required to provide the target sequence that they use for their experiment. Um, and so here, we these are all amino acid variants here. Um, and then everybody has to provide a score. So every data table has to have a column called score that describes the score. And then there's a, a method section where um, people who are uploading their data can describe you know, what statistical method they used or what approach they used to calculate those scores. Um, and then we allow people to add any number of optional additional, additional columns because again, the data are so heterogeneous that there's no way that we can say, these are the columns that we support. That just doesn't make sense because people are doing this in different ways. There's old data sets, there's new data sets. So this one, for example, we have a standard deviation. We have the number of, of experimental replicates in which the variant was observed. We have standard error of the mean, and then we have uh, the 95% confidence interval. Now, not all, all data sets will have this. Some of them will just have a standard deviation. Some of them will have nothing. Some of them will just have a confidence interval. Some of them will give you the individual replicate scores for all of the replicates. And it's kind of up to the person who is using the data um, to figure out what to do with all of that stuff. But we didn't want to tell people not to give us information that they had that might be useful later. Um, so we, do, we did adopt this sort of very flexible Schema, unfortunately, modern databases like Postgres allow you to kind of do this without needing to have, you know, a table with 8,000 
different columns in it, which are mostly unpopulated. Um, and I'm happy to answer any sort of technical questions about that sort of thing um, at the end, but uh, if you have questions, um, but I'm not gonna, you know, I didn't wanna turn this into a software engineering, how to build a database talk. Um, so we have a, a web interface uh, for, for MeDB that includes, um, you know, several different parts. So we have like a title up at the top and a short description of the data set. Uh, we can automatically generate very effect maps for people. Um, and we're building out, you know, the sort of the types of visualizations that we're able to provide. Um, we have some curation-based metadata, like who uploaded the data set, when was it up uploaded, has it been, has it been updated? Um, and then we have like the abstract and methods and other key text elements. There's also information about the target sequence and so on. Uh, when a data set becomes public, we freeze the scores, like the score table, and we freeze the information about the target because that's what defines the variance, but the text um, remains editable. So again, we wanted to have a sort of a low barrier to entry. So someone can just like put something in like the abstract and methods and just get the data up on the database and then come back later. Cause we didn't want everything to have to be we figured. If we told everybody that everything had to be perfect when they uploaded it in the first instance, it would be a big barrier for people who wanted to share their data. And we want to make it as easy as possible. So, um, so that's what you would see if you went to the MediaDB website um, now and search for this, this data set. Um, we also have an API. So the API can do everything that the website can do because the API drives the website. Um, and so we can support upload and download via API, which is good for the sort of power users. Um, and you can also uh, you know, support queries and things like that. Um, for the people that are interested in machine learning uh, and, and building models of this kind of data, we get asked a lot, you know, where's my download all button? There's no download all button, but we are um, we are getting ready to do our first uh, kind of version data release um, via Zenodo. So we'll just kind of package everything up in one, you know, downloadable compressed archive, and then we'll be able to have um, a data release that then you can cite by DOI and include, and then people can go back and get that version of the data, even if the database changes, which I think is important for um, reproducibility and recomputability. Um, so, so if you are, if you just want to get all the data like soon, you don't have to go and write a for loop to scrape the API. You can um, you can wait for us to do that to to provide that for you. And then we also have a um, a Python SDK in development. So for people who don't want to have to format their own REST API queries, uh, we've written a Python library that allows um, someone using like a Jupyter notebook or something similar to, uh, you know, format data sets, send them to the API, request data, get back a Python object. And we hope that that will make it easier for people who want to do this, like maybe more than once or twice, but like not actually have to you know, become experts in how how websites work and talk to each other, and to make data sets easier to um, to find and to and to and to deal with, we've also developed uh, a minimum information standards and controlled vocabulary document. So this has a project summary, a summary of the experiment and how the how the library was generated, what type of cell it is, what sort of phenotypic assay, how the sequencing was done, um, and so this is a, a structured, validatable um, JSON schema based. Uh, document model, um, and it's really designed for um, us to be able to, to share the data more broadly. We tried to use existing ontologies wherever possible so that the data becomes searchable and discoverable. Um, here's an example from one of the P10 data sets I showed you before. So we've got our project summary that has the title and the publication. We've got some information about the experiments, including these relevance codes. These are the, the diseases from OMIM or, OMIM or MONDO that um, the experimenter thought were relevant to the assay, um, and then some other stuff about you know, the library generation and so on. Because before we did this, everything was in free text, and so it was really hard to find other similar data sets. So we sat down um, with a bunch of experts in, um, in the experimental technology, and we said, okay, so what are like the 20 or 30 sets of, of keywords and phrases that can cover all of the different types of things that people are doing and let's just make a list of those and let people pick the best one for their experiment. So now it will be, become much easier for people who want to, for example, 
plan an experiment and they can go to MapDB and say, well, show me all the other data sets that also use this technology that I'm thinking about using so that I can go and read those papers. So we're thinking about how to make it a, a more of a resource than just for people that want to download data sets. And we're also wanting, and as I mentioned, MapDB is a sort of a self-service database. So, so researchers can upload their own data. Um, and, and we want to use the data standards as a way to promote data deposition. So if somebody deposits their data and then they fill out the minimum information standards, then we can give them a little report back um, and like a document that, that says, you know, good job, here's your minimum information standards. Maybe we can format it as a PDF for them. And then that can get uploaded um, as at submission time when they go to publish their work. And then we sort of developed this way of um, ensuring that uh, people who are publishing this type of experiment have actually kind of thought this through and have, have thought about how to make, make their data you know, open and, and accessible. Um, now, if we really want people to use the data, then we need to solve some other important problems like mapping variants to the human genome. So we have a bunch of variants here on the blue side where you know, we have a variant that's in some organism based on some target sequence. And what really what we want to do is kind of bridge this gap and get it over into the human reference genome so that people can use it for clinical applications. Because MapDB doesn't know about the human reference genome. It knows what target sequence was used for the experiment. And this is important because for a lot of historical and technical reasons, the sequences that people use as the basis for their, for their experiment are not necessarily reference identical. And so we decided to, um, to look to the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health, G4GH, and their new variant representation specification, um, which allows us to solve this in, I think, a fairly elegant way, which is that we can have two of these variant objects, one that describes the variant with respect to the original target sequence, which is what you'd find in MAVDB, and then another object that, that describes the variant with respect to the human genome. And then we can assert that these are homologous to each other. And just like I said before, when I was talking about the reanalysis, we can track all the way back the sort of the provenance of that variant. So you can say, well, this variant in the human genome was actually this variant with respect to this sequence in the assay. So if you are concerned about that or are wondering what's going on or just really want to make sure that you have the full story before trying to use this, um, especially in a clinical context, we wanted to make sure that we're not papering over any of that and that we're making it really clear um, exactly what happened and where the data came from. Now, in terms of talking about why we're using why we're using VERSE, so HGVS is a very common format for human variants. We use a very limited subset of HGVS internally in MAVDB, primarily because it was a standard that was well documented that we could use. Um, this is what an HGVS string looks like. Um, it's got a reference accession number. So here this is chromosome 19. It's got a prefix that says it's a genomic position. There's G dot, C dot for coding position, P dot for protein, and so on. And then we've got a position. This is the position on chromosome 19. And then we've got a substitution. So it's a C to T. And so this is something that we can kind of pick apart and we can think about and we can look at. And this is one data standard that's used a lot in human genetics. Um, but HGBS can become very complex and hard to parse. So this is also a valid HGBS from the HGBS documentation. This is a um, this is a, a duplication that's inverted that has uncertain endpoints. And you can see there's like a lot of other stuff going on. So if you're thinking about how can I write a parser that will parse the thing on the top and the thing on the bottom, it's really hard. It's very very challenging to do this. And it's and this I think is a, is an example of a systematic format that is for people and not for computers. Whereas VERSE is a verbose but easily computable standard that is for computers. And so here's an example of this HGBS variant in VERSE. So you can see this is like, we've got like a hash here, then we've got this location. It even says there's a type. It says the type is a number, and then it's got the number's got a value. Like this is, you don't wanna have to look at this or write this, but if you're trying to write a computer system that is going to share some data with another computer system, this kind of very verbose structured document format is way easier to deal with because you don't have to worry about the kind of complications and parsing something that's like ambiguous or worrying about like, you know, complicated parsers breaking or interpreting things slightly differently. Um, and the reason why this is important is because it enables sharing and integration. So we are um, doing a lot of work to um, to integrate MeDB data with uh, everywhere else that we would 
that people go to get data. So we've we're we're working with you know Uniprod and Ensemble. We've got the data in uh, the Broad Institute um, Gene Subpoena Types Atlas. We're putting the stuff in the UCSC Genome Browser. There's going to be a there's a I've seen the uh, a demo of the heat map, those sequence function maps in the UCSC browser, like in the UCSC like green and purple color scheme. It's pretty cool. You know, we're sharing data within this IGVF consortium, which is a large NIH and HGRI consortium that I'm a part of. Um, and so we really want to try to focus on getting the data standards right for the MAVE data, figuring out how to represent the variants, and then being able to get that out into all of these other places where people want to go to look for data for research. And also into, into the clinic. So we'll talk about you know, building clinical data models because what the people who are trying to use the data for um, clinical variant curation want is a little bit different and a little and what they need is a little bit different than what researchers want. Researchers are happy to have a whole data set. They're happy to just like have the scores um, and then do something with them. But this bit is about taking that that assay data and trying to convert it into clinical evidence. So before we start talking about evidence, um, you know, I'll give you just a very, very brief introduction to the ACMG evidence framework. So this is kind of the rubric that people use to determine whether a variant is pathogenic or benign. Um, it's kind of a point system based on what evidence you can fit where in this table. So the rows here are different types of evidence. The columns are what type of support it is. So it can be evidence for on the left, it can be evidence for uh, being benign. On the right, it can be evidence for pa being pathogenic at various levels of strength. So in terms of some data, types of data that you might be familiar with, so NOMAD is here at the top under population data. We have computational predictive data, so that's all the in silico predictors, you know, CAD scores, Verity, alpha missense, whatever it is that you would want to use. And then MAVEs are here in functional data. And in particular, we want to help clinicians fit the data from our assays into these two boxes. One is it is a well-established functional study with no deleterious effect, and which is strong evidence for being benign, or a well-established functional study that shows a deleterious effect, which is strong evidence for pathogenicity. So we want to help people interpret our data in this context. Now, if we look at um, a representative multiplex assay, this is data from BRCA1, we get this kind of bimodal distribution where we have um, all these synonymous variants and this sort of distribution around zero, which are <clears throat> probably have very little effect. And then around minus two, we have the nonsense variants and a bunch of other missense variants um, <clears throat> that are likely loss of function. And so those would be evidence towards pathogenicity. So when we want to evaluate the strength of a, of a MAVE assay, we can look at what's known. So we can look at all the independent, all the variants that were independently classified already in ClinVar. Uh, in BRCA1, this works very well. So if we look at the scores from the functional assay uh, for all the variants that were classified, we can see the, we get this nice separation between pathogenic and benign. Um, we can also look at the distribution of nonsense and synonymous scores, and again, try to sort of separate these two and then say, okay, well, if the variant is, if or the variant in question is over here in this benign distribution or this synonymous distribution, then it is probably evidence of normal activity and therefore being benign and vice versa. Uh, it's not always this straightforward. So if we look at P10, P10 has almost no benign variants that are known despite being very well studied. Um, and the, the data is uh, not quite as, as clear cut, but we can still kind of do this sort of separation. And if we go through this and we apply um, the uh, the kind of the the international standards from from ClinGen um, from the ClinGen sequence variant interpretation working group, and we you know assign strength of evidence, we can reclassify a lot of variants of uncertain significance using MAVE data. And so these donut plots here are showing you the number of variants that were reclassified. Uh, from a cohort from Ambry Genetics. So these were data, these were variants that were not in any database. They weren't in ClinVar or anything like that before. But if we include the MAVE data, we we're able to solve um, almost half of the of the variants of uncertain significance in BRCA1. Um, you know, P53 also were able to solve a lot of these variants. Uh, P10, as you may have guessed from you know how we saw what we saw before, 
uh, we weren't able to um, to resolve as many of those variants, but it's still uh, clearly making a, a difference. Um, and so these are real patients. And so I think that all these patients actually got results returned to them um, based on the introduction of the MAVE data uh, that was enabled by this study. Um, so that was really encouraging for us and showed us that we were on the right track and that this it's important to kind of get the data into the hands of clinicians. So we're thinking about how to present the MAVE data for clinical variant classification. Now, this is different from the sort of researcher-focused interface that I showed you before. So here's kind of a mock-up of what we're thinking because a clinician is going to, rather than being interested in a gene or being interested in the data from a paper, they're interested in knowing as much as possible about the one variant that they found in a patient, in like a patient exome or whatever, and they want to know as much as they can about it. So we're developing these different visualizations to help interpret the score so we can show them the distribution of scores and then show them where their variant falls in that distribution, which we think is a very um, useful and intuitive way to help interpret um, uh, the score for an individual variant because they really do the scores really do make the most sense in the context of the population of variants in the assay. Um, we can provide these uh, clinical evidence codes where where possible. Um, and then we can also link out to other data sources. And I think this is another benefit of, you know, the data standardization and APIs and things like that is that once we figure out how to send our data out, that's a two-way bridge, right? So we can then use those standards that allow us to send our stuff to, you know, ClinVar or ClinGen or Uniprot to request information and pull in annotations that will then um, make... Uh, the MAVEDB experience a better one for the people that are using um, using our stuff. So uh, this is what we're working on for um, for clinical variant classification. We're we're hoping to roll this out um, later this year uh, in consultation with the clinical genetics community. Um, and we're also developing a new global standard for functional data that combines the minimum information standards, which capture all the relevant information about the assay, maybe what um, what patient phenotypes is especially relevant for, and then we're combining that with some established standards that ClinGen has been using to um, curate uh, lower throughput functional assays for clinical use. And then we're putting those together and we're um, working with uh, G4GH to get this adopted as um, an international standard for functional data that we can then implement in MeDB and help use it to power um, you know, future, future uh, data exchange. Um, and then this also gives everybody a shared standard to target if someone wants to build, you know, build this into like their clinical dashboard or something like this for, for um, a variant curation scientists. Um, so we're, we're trying to enable the discoverability of data because that I think is a big issue that people who are doing this kind of work clinically, they just don't know what MAVE data is available, they, and we want to make sure that it's easier for them to find out. And so the best way to do that is to push our data out to where the clinicians already are. Uh, the clinicians are very, very busy. They don't need another website to visit. Uh, so we want to make sure that it's as easy as possible for us to, um, for them to just ingest the data. Um, so we're working with uh, the ClinGen Link Data Hub. We're working to put the functional data um, in, in ClinVar directly, because that's kind of the first stop for most people that have a variant that they're curious about. Uh, working with Decipher um, in the UK. Um, in Australia, we are, are, are funded through the MRFF to push the data into Shariant, which is a platform um, for clinicians to share their variant curations. And we're also working closely um, with New South, Wales, New South Wales Health Pathology, um, who are going to try out um, all the kind of data standards and data models um, with their clinicians to see, you know, is this working for them in practice when this, because you never know, like you can build the best data model in the world, but if the clinicians don't want to use it, then it, it it's not a really a very good data model after all. So we want to really make sure that this is a continuum dialogue between us who are trying to organize the data and, you know, really know a lot more about generating and analyzing the data to, to continue to, um, to talk to the people who are going to be using the data to make sure that it's working for them. Um, also to this end, we've been doing a lot of education and training um, to educate clinicians about MAVE. So we had a, uh, a really excellent workshop on the clinical application of MAVE data um, last year. There's now a, a workshop report out in the um, European Journal of Human Genetics 
um, if people are, are curious to learn more about kind of what people are thinking about this stuff, what's the sort of international consensus right now? So this was, it It felt right in between the curating the clinical genome meeting, which is the sort of for people that are very serious about um, clinical vari variant curation, and then the mutational scanning symposium, which is where all the, um, all the MAVE data generation, um, that's sort of our main conference. And so we we had this overlap in the middle to kind of capture both those groups of people and kind of get everybody together to talk about what is actually what does translation actually look like for these data sets. Um, we're also working uh, again through this through this MRFF to um, develop uh, you know workshops for for training and also starting with it, with needs assessment surveys things like that through the Human Genetic Society of Australasia um, and then the Australian Functional Genomics Network. Um, to try to kind of get the word out and and help make people aware that uh, these data sets are available, that they may be useful resources for their clinical practice, and also to help us find out, you know, what what other things do people want to know? What are, what's going to make them feel most confident um, using using these data sets? So I hope that I've I've shown you a, a little bit about how we think that high throughput functional data can help us uh, solve this problem with variance of uncertain significance and contribute to sort of all of the different phases of this um, of this cycle here. Uh, I'd like to uh, to acknowledge um, my colleagues, many people who've been working on this, uh, in particular the DB dev team, which is split between um, uh, Melbourne and then Seattle, uh, based at the University of Washington and Broughtman Beatty Institute. Um, uh, the work is funded by MRFF and also the, uh, the National Institutes of Health, particularly the National Human Genome Research Institute and the IGVF consortium. And then um, we are also um, very active in the Atlas of Variant Effects Alliance, which is this international organization for people that want to um, you know, use these kinds of data sets, generate these kinds of data sets. Um, if you're interested in this, in this kind, of, kind of work or this, this kind of data, um, that QR code will take you to where you need to go to join. Uh, it's free. It's a really wonderful international community, highly collaborative. Um, really supportive. And um, with that, I would be very happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thanks, Alan, for that introduction to all of the different efforts you're putting into coordinating clinical variant effect work. And for the overview of MAVEDB, which I'm sure is going to be a fantastic resource for anyone working on genetic variation. We do have time for questions now. If you have a question for Alan, please write that into the Q&A box and we'll do our best to answer it for you. I have some questions to kick us off. Now, any resources is only as good as the data that's in it. So how can researchers get their data into MAVEDB? Right, so um, we have some requirements in terms of the format. Um, so, you know, you have to format a data table, you have to use the variant syntax that MaveDB understands, that it can validate things. Um, we try to make it pretty straightforward. So there's a, there's kind of two paths. There's like the web form format where you can go and fill out all the fields and then upload the data that way. Uh, more advanced users can, can use the API. I think the web form, especially for someone who's new, is, is easier. Um, and then once the data has been uploaded, it goes into sort of, um, like a, a, it gets a temp accession number. And so you can go and look at it and make sure that it's formatted correctly. And then um, you click on, on the publish button and then it gets a, a public accession number and then, be, and then we freeze the scores and, and so on. Um, so anybody can do this. We are, we are trying to develop some kind of automated quality control um, processes and things like that, but we don't want to block anyone from uploading their data. Again, because there are so many different kinds of assays um, that you can't really tell whether an assay is in general good or bad. It is It is only like, concord maybe it's concordant with like clinical, what's known clinically, maybe it isn't. That doesn't mean it's good or bad. It may be measuring something else. Um, that's not as clinically relevant. So we want to, to make that easier for people who are downloading the data to know what data sets we think are, are higher quality, but, um, but it's, it's really open to anybody. And we're also very happy to provide support to people 
who are trying to upload their data for the first time. Um, there is a bunch of documentation. The documentation for every project is not updated as quickly as the software is. So um, if you do run into problems and you want to upload some data, do reach out. We also are happy to accept data from um, lower throughput experiments, uh, but we just haven't had the capacity to try to curate it. It's great to hear that you have that um, support for submitting data. What's the best way for people to get in touch with you or your team about doing that? Yeah, so I think for now, probably emailing me directly is probably the best way. We are in the process of setting up a Google group to kind of make it easier. There's also, we're also reachable on Atlas of Variant Effects Slack, but that requires the extra step of becoming a member and then getting onboarded and then being able to join join Slack. So that's probably the easiest way for us, um, but not necessarily the easiest way for, for someone who just wants to get their question answered. So we're looking forward to um, to to publicize in the Google Group more once once that's get set, gotten set up and once we figured out you know how we're gonna gonna handle moderating it and things like that. That's great, thank you. I'm moving to a different question now. You mentioned that you're mapping the variants to the human genome. Which version of the human genome are you using? Yeah, so we are primarily mapping to HG38, um, but I. But that's the, all that's inside the, the verse object. So we could, if we wanted to, you know, map to 38, 37, 17, 18, 19. You know, we could provide all of the different flavors that people might want. Um, but I think that we're going to start by targeting 38, and then people can lift over if they need to. Fortunately, for most of the data that we have, which is coding, coding variants, mm -hmm that not the the lift over for that is like pretty straightforward. So because we kind of know what those regions look like. Okay. We would like to also be able to support stuff like T to T and some of these 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 new things that are working on. And so one of the benefits, I guess, of setting up this kind of mapping problem as sort of its own thing is that we'll be able to to extend that in ways that make sense over time. Okay, that's good to know. So look, as long as we know which one it is, then it makes the mapping process much easier. And that also, like you were talking about, makes the interoperability with other resources much easier as well. So you can combine forces and create this kind of uber resource for people to explore variants. That's, that's really excellent. So we are going to leave it there for today. Thank you again, Alan, for taking the time to talk to us today. Before we leave, I have a few more things to share with our audience. Firstly, as I mentioned earlier, this webinar is part of a series of training events that we offer, and you can find out more about upcoming webinars and workshops on our website. You can also subscribe to our newsletter or to our domain-specific mailing list for more information on specific projects. So thank you once again, Alan, for coming and sharing your uh, insights into the MAVE-DV project into clinical variation in general globally. And thank you to everyone for joining us as well. The Australian Biocommons is enabled by ENCRIS via Bioplatforms Australia funding. That's all for today, and we hope to see you again soon. Until then, goodbye for now.